All right, so continuing on, remember this, this was the first derivative. This kind of makes sense. So like if you have x equal to f of t, okay, and y equal to g of t, so that just means that x and y are each individually functions of the parameter, right? So we have a parametrized curve uh, where x and y are both functions of that parameter. And if I want the slope of the curve at a particular point, and by the way, um, you know, just to be clear, that means that this is like, so what is X? That means that this is the point F of T comma G of T. Does that make sense? Right, so this point is determined by T. Okay, so this point is determined by T. Okay, by the particular uh, t value that you are looking at. Then what is the derivative going to be? Well, it looks like there's, uh, here's the formula we, we, uh, uh, that I gave you, but it looks, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, it looks like the dt is kind of like canceling in some sense, right? You have to be careful about these differentials that you're not, you're not horsing around with stuff that isn't true. It's not really true that the differentials are canceling, but th that, that's an easy way to remember the formula at least. You know what I mean? Like you want dy dx at that point, uh, at that point t, and the first thing you say is, well, wait a minute, everything is in terms of t now. How do I get the derivative in terms of t? And the answer is like this. It's dy dt divided by dx dt, okay? And then what Michael was just asking about was, uh, look, I, I, you know, I'm, I don't understand the first derivative part. Well, um, let me just, or the second derivative part. Well, let me just rewrite this. This is basically like y prime. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So if I wanted the second derivative, if I wanted the second derivative, would that not just be the derivative d dx of y prime? Yeah, yeah, right. So then, so then what? Uh, this is, let me just write dy prime <laughs> over dx. So then what, what you would do to get this is you would just say, well, it's dy prime dt divided by dx dt. So what this is saying is you need to take the derivative with respect to t of y prime. And after all, y prime, this is going to be a function of what variable? Think about it. We just converted everything over into t. So y prime is a function of what? t. Therefore, it's possible to take the derivative of y prime with respect to t. Yeah? So this is over dx dt. Does that make sense? So I mean, basically, y is now replaced by y prime. Does that make sense? y is now replaced by y prime in this equation up here. Instead of y, it's just y prime. Yeah, I did one in the videos, but I'll do the same thing again. So watch this, okay? So we go over here. So this is, by the way, I said that there was like a little typo right here. There should be a y right there. And this is saying, take the derivative with respect to t of, that's just y prime, correct? Mm -hmm. Divided by dx dt. And then you can keep going from there. This is basically saying, take the derivative, if you want the third derivative, Take the derivative with respect to t of, what's that? Well, that's just y prime prime, right? <laughs> and then you divide by dx dt again, okay? So this was the little formula that we came up with. Here was an example that we were working with. So if x is given by t squared and y is given by t cubed minus 3t, what is the derivative at the particular point on the curve corresponding to t? Okay, so what is dy dx? Well, it's going to be dy, what? dt over dx dt. What's dy dt? Uh, minus 3 divided by, what's dx dt? Yeah, and, and so that I don't have to do something crazy later on, because I know I'm going to have to take the derivative of this later. Uh, I, I might as well just divide the first and second thing in the numerator by 2t, all right? So what do I get? Like three halves 
Uh, three halves what? T squared over T, what is that? Three halves T minus three over two T, right? Which I'll write, I'll write that as three halves T to the what? Negative first power, okay? So then if I want the second derivative, then that means I need to take, or dx squared, that means I need to take the derivative of this thing with respect to t. I need to take the derivative with respect to t of dy dx, the thing I just got, over dx dt. Yeah? And so what is the derivative of this thing with respect to t? Minus, or actually the negative one comes down, it's gonna be plus three halves T to the what? Yeah. Over two T, the derivative of X with respect to T again. And if I really wanted to, I could, uh, I could simplify this again. I could take the three halves over two T. Isn't that gonna be, that's like gonna be three over four T, isn't it? Yeah which is basically three fourths T to the minus one. If you think about it for a second, and then it's gonna be plus three fourths what? T to the minus two over T, that's just T to the minus third power, three power, right? Okay. And then even if they asked me for the third derivative, I could, I could now do it at this point without too much hassle, yeah? You'd sort of pull it off. You would take the derivative with respect to t of this and divide by dx dt. That's the general pattern that's going on here. You take the derivative of the y part with respect to t and divide by dx dt, yeah? That's what's happening here. The y part could be the derivative of y or the second derivative of y, et cetera. Okay, any questions on that? Questions? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, let me clear this. Might ask you guys for that pretty soon. Let's let's actually look at this thing. Okay, and I said, you know, it's it's a little bit tricky sometimes to extract information from these parametrized curves. But let's talk about that a little bit. So here I'm asking you for the tangent lines, the tangent lines where the curve crosses itself at three, zero, okay? So the tangent lines where the curve crosses itself at three, zero. Well, where does the curve cross itself? Okay, so that's a question I would have. Where does the curve cross? Uh, well, it crosses at three zero, but what I mean by, by that is what values of the parameter give us the same point? Okay, what values of the parameter give us the same point? So for instance, like T is moving us around on the curve, yes? The parameter T is kind of moving us around on this curve, but there's gotta be a couple of values of the parameter that give the exact same X coordinate and the exact same Y coordinate. Does that make sense? There's got to be two, two values of the parameter that give us the exact same X coordinate and the exact same Y coordinate. Okay, so let's just say, suppose this happens at S and T. And of course, S and T would have to be different from each other, okay? Then what would be true? Well, the X coordinates would have to be the same, correct? Wouldn't the X coordinates have to be the same? for both S and T, because I'm at the same point, right? So the X coordinates would have to be the same. So doesn't that mean, like if I, if I kind of think about X, that means that like S squared would have to be equal to what? 
S squared would have to be T squared, correct? Yeah. And what about the Y parts? Well, again, since we're visiting the same point, the Y parts would have to be equal as well, correct? So wouldn't that mean that like S cubed minus three S, right? The value of Y at the parameter S would have to be the same as T cubed minus three T. You see what I'm saying? Yes? And look, what I would have to do, do you see I have two equations and two unknowns? This thing is a mess because I have lots of squares and cubes in it. Do you know what I mean? I have a ton of square and cube looking things in here. But look, watch this. This guy right here, let me just say, this is the same thing as uh, S cubed minus T cubed. S cubed minus T cubed is equal to, is equal to what? I, I could move, like if I move the T cubed over to here and the three S thing over to here, this will be three S minus three T, correct? So let me just write this as three times the quantity S minus T, all right? So that's, that's kind of an equivalent way of writing things. This guy over here is easy, easy to rewrite. Isn't that the same thing as S squared minus T squared equals zero or something? Yes? You see what I mean? Um, and what I can do here, like the S squared minus T squared, I'm telling you S squared minus T squared, how does that factor? How does S squared minus T squared factor? It's a, it's a difference of squares. So it's like S minus T times S plus T. Do you know what I mean? Okay, so this is like S minus T times S plus T equals zero, correct? Now, what about the second guy right here? Does that guy factor? Does the left-hand side of that factor? That's difference of cubes. Do you remember how to factor a difference of cubes? You guys remember? Is it minus or plus? It's plus, uh, actually this is plus ST plus what? Okay, and what is that equal to? Well, it's equal to three times S minus T, okay? So here's the thing. You guys realize that we can cancel the S minus, look, look, look at this. I have an S minus T on both sides of this equation. I can cancel those. Why can I cancel those? Because, because S and T are not equal. Therefore, S minus T is different from zero. Does that make sense? So I can actually cancel that from both sides. And I can actually cancel this guy from both sides also. Yeah? So what do these two things end up becoming when you think about it for a couple of seconds? These two equations, what do they turn into? S plus T equals zero and S squared plus ST plus T squared equals what? Three, yeah? Now this first equation right here, you guys know, you guys realize this first equation, S plus T equals zero, doesn't that just mean that S is, S is the negative of T, correct? So can't I just straight like put that in here and solve for what T has to be, yes? So if I plug in S equal to minus T, I'm going to get T squared what? Minus, <laughs> minus T squared plus T squared equals three. What happens to the T squareds? Yeah, two of them cancel. And I just get T squared is three. So what does that mean that T is? T is equal to plus or minus the square root of three, okay? 
And of course, S would, whatever T is, because of this, whatever T is, uh, S would be the opposite of that. So that tells us that the two places, okay, the two places or the two parameter values where the thing crosses itself is at what? At what two values? Plus or minus the square root of three, yes? And so what happens when I plug in, uh, what happens when I plug in the square root of three and for, and for y? So like, so think about it. What is, what is the square root of three, square root of three cubed minus three times the square root of three? You guys realize that that's just zero? Like if I take the square root of three and I cube it, it's gonna be square root of three times square root of three, which is three times the square root of three. This is just straight zero. Does that make sense? And the same thing is gonna happen when I plug in negative the square root of three. That's how this point was found, was by kind of doing that parameter algebra. That's why I mean by it's sort of tricky to find places where curves cross themselves. You end up having to do some fancy like algebra with parameters, okay? Uh, but, but this point is visited twice, three comma zero, is visited twice. It's visited when, so this is visited when what? When the parameter is equal to, what are the two values? Plus or minus square root of three, okay? Okay, that's a little bit tricky, but uh, I just wanted to, uh, to point out how that value was arrived at, how that point was arrived at. Are there any, uh, any questions on that? We had to do a little bit of factoring and canceling some stuff, but any questions on that? Yeah. I know we're going to do that right now. Yeah. So I was just, I was just, that was just an explanation for, for how that point was arrived at. I mean, that came out of thin air, correct? I just said, hey, the curve crosses itself at three zero. What? Right? Why, how do you know it crosses itself at three zero? Well, we can actually, we can actually find out, we can, we can actually determine that from first principles, okay? What if I would have said, find both tangent lines where the curve crosses itself? And I wouldn't have said the last part. Then what would you have been required to do? Find that point, and we would have had to do that stuff. Does that make sense? So I just wanted to show you how you do that, okay? Any other questions on that? And now we know a lot. Let's go over here into Desmos and and uh, look at some stuff here. So hang on a second. Okay. So here's this curve. Okay. You guys see this? Yeah. So uh, here's me kind of traversing this, this curve. Notice that, that the thing does cross itself at three zero. Yes. And where is this happening? We just, we just sorted out what values of the parameter that happens at. T equal to what? T equal to plus or minus the square root of three is where we kind of visit that point, okay? And we're supposed to find the tangent lines here. Well, that means that we need to know what dy dx is, correct? We need to know the slope. dy dx, though, is equal to what? What's the formula for dy dx? We already did this, but it's in your notes, right? It's dy dt over dx dt, yeah? Which we already kind of sorted this out. That was three t squared minus three over, over two t. And then we kind of simplified this, correct? We said that that's like three halves t minus, uh, let's write it minus three over two t. Okay, so that is the formula for the slope. And we want the slope at specific parameter values, don't we? We want it at plus or minus the square root of three, okay? So what are the equations of those tangent lines going to be? Well, it's kind of a, let's sort that out here, okay? So let's see, uh, first of all, I want the tangent. So we want the tangent and I'm doing here. I'm, I'm actually going to. I'm going to write it down here at the lower right, just so you can continue to 
uh, be marveled at that moving point on that thing. I'm going to pause it though because it's a distraction right now. Okay, so there we go. So, uh, what is the tangent at t equal to negative the square root of three? Okay, and by the way, uh, t equal to the negative square root of three. That's that's going to be. Let me just uh, write this down. That is going to be uh, this guy. Yes, because it kind of, it seems like it was traversing the curve in that direction from negative two to two, yes? So t equal to negative square root of three, that's the, the first time it's kind of on its way up at that point, yes? Okay, what's interesting is the point is on its way up, but what's the slope of that tangent line? Is it negative or positive? That's, that's actually negative, do you see? Okay, so let's kind of pause this for a minute. Here, I'll, I'll try to pause it as soon as it, yeah, it's kind of it just whipped right past that thing. So let's see here. I want dy dx. So watch. Here, there's like there's some nice notation you can use. dy dx. That's the slope evaluated at t equal to negative the square root of three. What is that? Okay. What is the slope at t equal to the negative square root of three? Well, I just plug it into that formula. Okay. So it's going to be negative three square root of three over two. Okay. Minus, uh, but if I plug in negative square root of three, doesn't that turn that into a plus? Do you see what I'm saying? If I'm plugging in t equal to minus square root of three, doesn't it turn that minus into a plus? Yeah. All right. So it's going to be plus. Uh, okay. Think about it for a minute. Plus. So what's three over the square root of three? What is that actually? What's three over the square root of three? Uh, isn't that just the square root of three? Yeah, three over the square root of three is just the square root of three. So it's gonna be plus the square root of three over two. So let me ask you a question. Is that value, is that value for that slope positive or negative? Look, I, I, both of those things are over two. I have the square root of three minus three square root of threes. So what is that? It's negative how many square root of threes? Minus two square root of three over two. And lo and behold, the twos cancel. And what do we get for the slope? Negative square root of three. That's weird, isn't it? The actual slope is the same as the parameter here, which is kind of strange, okay? Okay, any questions on that before we, we use that little calculation? Any questions on that? Uh, because we're, we're gonna write down the equation of the tangent line. Remember the, tang the equation of a line is just like y minus y zero equals what? Yeah, m times the quantity x minus x zero. But remember, the point we're interested in here is the point three comma zero. Do you know what I'm saying? So our x zero is three and our y zero is zero, correct? So what's the tangent? Y equals, right, y minus zero basically equals, what's our slope? Negative root three times what? X minus three, exactly. Okay, so let me kind of box this. Okay. Um, okay. And what about at, let me go to the upper left part. So that that's what, it, that's the, that corresponds to T equal to negative three. Okay, that corresponds to the uh, tangent line, T equal to, to negative radical three. and. The slope is negative, which is exactly what we expected to happen. But what about at t equal to square root of three? How are things really gonna be different if I do t equal to the square root of three? Well, dy dx, let's just write it. dy dx evaluated at t equal to the square root of three. What is that gonna be? Well, it's gonna be three square root of three over two. Okay, 
minus three over two square root of three. Again, what's three over square root of three again? What's that? Square root of three. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, and it's minus, yes? So it's minus uh, square root of three over two. So I have three square root of threes all over two minus a square root of three over two. What's that? That's two square root of three over two, which is just square root of three. So the slope at t equal to square root of three is just the flip of what it was for t equal to minus square root of three, yes? That makes sense because there's a nice symmetry going on here. So what is the tangent line going to be? Y minus zero equals the slope times X minus, or Y minus, right, Y minus zero equals the slope times X minus three, correct? So it's gonna be Y equal to square root of three times X minus three, okay? So there's the tangent line that corresponds to T equal to the square root of three. Now let's actually graph both of these just so that we can see all of this in practice. Any questions on that before we actually just graph this just to see both of those lines? Okay, so let me go down here, and actually graph these things. What, what was it? Y equal to what? Negative square root of three times what? X minus three, you see that? Is that the tangent line we expected? Sure. And of course, if I do the other one, y equal to the square root of three times x minus three, I get the other one, yes? The other one kind of uh, going through that point in the upward direction rather than the downward direction. Does that make sense? And what's the direction that this curve is traversed? Think about it. So it's always nice to kind of know that. You see that? So for increasing value of the parameter, looks like I'm moving in this direction. Yeah. So that's that's cool. All right. Cool. Let me uh, turn those guys off, and we'll come back to this in a in a couple minutes here. So done. Let me go back in here. Oh, wait, I don't, I don't have to reshare anything. I just have to go right here. Okay. Okay, so we found both the tangent lines where the curve crosses itself at three zero. Again, those occurred at T equal to plus or minus square root of three. And we found out that for t equal to negative square root of three, uh, we had the tangent line y equal to negative square root of three times x minus three. And for t equal to the positive square root of three, we got y equal to the square root of three times x minus three, yeah? And we even explained where this point came from using some fancy parameter algebra, okay? Any questions on that? We'll do another problem kind of like this, but uh, any questions on that? Find the points where there is a horizontal or vertical tangent line. Well, what's the formula for dy dx? We already came up with it. What was it? Three halves t minus, yeah, three over two t basically, yeah, okay. So what would it mean for the tangent line to be horizontal? Yeah, that would mean that dy dx is equal to zero, yeah? Which would mean that uh, that was equal to three halves t minus three over two t. Okay, to solve that, I would be inclined to multiply everything through by uh, by 2t. Do you know what I'm saying? Just to kind of clear denominators, I would multiply everything through by 2t. And then I get like zero equals, what happens if I multiply that first guy by 2t? What do I end up with? Yeah, 3t squared. Okay. And what about the second t? Minus 
three. That's interesting. That's just like dy dt, isn't it? Well, that makes sense because that's what was in the numerator. Remember that? That was in the numerator of the derivative, uh, the derivative formula. Okay. So, hmm, what are the two values of t where that happens? Where is 3t squared uh, minus 3 equals 0? Yeah. Yeah, 3t squared is equal to 3, which means t squared is equal to 1, which means, as Michael was saying, t is either what? 1 or negative 1. Exactly right. Okay. The points where there is a horizontal or a vertical tangent line. So horizontal, I just need to plug in t equal to plus or minus 1. What are the points that I get? If I plug in 1, right, if I plug in 1, so t equal to 1, uh, I get the point 1 comma, what is it, 1 minus 3, which is negative 2, correct? And what if t is minus 1? Well, if t is minus 1, what do I, what do I have? It's still 1 in the x-coordinate, but what is it in the y-coordinate now? If I plug in minus 1, it's going to be, or if I plug in minus 1, it's going to be negative 1 plus Right, negative one plus three, yes? So that's two. So it's one comma negative two and one comma two. Does that make sense? It's one comma negative two and it's one comma two. Uh, by, by the way, that little fish-shaped graph, it makes sense that that would be the case, doesn't it? What's, does it look like there was two places where the thing had horizontal lines? And what this is saying is that's happening at t equal to one, and t equal to minus one, okay? What about a vertical tangent line? Where would we have a vertical tangent line? Where would we have a vertical tangent line? Yeah, dy dx does not exist at what t value? Where does dy dx not exist? Yeah, at t equal to zero. So, and by the way, if you plug in t equal to zero into this formula up here, what's our x coordinate gonna be? Zero, what's our y coordinate? Zero, yeah? So that's interesting. So I have one comma negative two and one comma two. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back over to uh, Desmos, and we'll kind of check those points out. Man, let me get rid of this junk. Are you serious, right? So let me just graph the two points. I can go one, two. Okay, there's one of the points. Okay, the other point is one comma negative two. Okay, there's that other point down there. Do you see that? Yeah. And what, what was the t value where this occurred at? Like one comma two, right? That's one comma two. Where did that occur? At t equal to what? Actually, no, not t equal to one. It was t equal to negative one. And where did this one occur? T equal to one, yes. And we had a, a vertical tangent line at zero, zero, yes. Okay, and where did that happen? T equal to what? Zero. And of course, this crossing point right here, we, we also figured out that that happens at T equal to plus or minus the square root of three, yes? So, I mean, if I were to kind of replay this thing, you could see this, you could see this thing passing through those points at the right times. So T equal to one, right? T equal to negative one, T equal to zero, T equal to one, T equal to positive square root of three, okay? And kind of see it passing through those various points, which is kind of interesting, okay? All right, any questions on that? I think that's interesting. Uh, moving on.
arc length formula. Okay. So like if I want to, if I want to like figure out the length of a curve that isn't a function necessarily, it might like wrap underneath itself. It's not a function of X necessarily, like this is X and this is Y up here. So here's a curve. Maybe the curve like goes in this direction or something. And this, this right here is the starting point. So this is the point where T is equal to A. And this is the point where T is equal to B, kind of where we finish things off. Well, it turns out that we can actually figure out the length of, the, of this curve by just taking the derivatives of each thing separately and adding up their squares and taking the square root. Turns out what's going on here is basically kind of like a Pythagorean theorem type thing, okay? Which is kind of interesting. You've, I, I think you've seen this formula before. Haven't you seen, uh, haven't you seen some kind of arc length formula before? It was like one plus F prime of X squared or something like that. Do you remember that? It was something like the integral. It was the integral from A to B the square root of one plus dy dx squared dx or something, yeah? If you had a curve that was uh, y equal to, you know, y was some function of x. Um, so here, basically, if you just replace dy and dx by uh, the formula in terms of t, you can factor this out and come up with this formula that, um, that we have sitting right here, okay? So that's one formula that we can use for, uh, we, can, we can use parametrized curves for, we can find arc lengths that way. So like for instance, in that example that we had back here, and by the way, S is often used for arc length. In the formula that we are in the uh, situation we had back here, what was dx, what's dx dt? What's dx dt? What is that? 2t, what's dy dt? 3t squared minus three, yeah? And so if I wanted to find the arc length, arc length, the, right, the notation we often use is s for arc length, okay? Uh, s, okay, it's going to be the integral from negative two to two, the square root of this disaster, you would take dx dt and square it, 2t and square it, and you would take this other thing and square it, 3t squared minus three, and you would square it, dt. Now, good luck finding an antiderivative for that thing. It's gonna be a mess, okay? It might be possible. We might be able to do some kind of completion of the square and then use maybe like a trig substitution or something. But most of the time you end up with something that's messy because you have this thing underneath the square root, yeah? Everything is underneath the square root in this case, okay? But at the very least, uh, you could use a computer to approximate this thing, yes? It would be able to like give you a numerical approximation and you would have a formula for the arc length, okay? So that's the length of that fish shape that we just had a few minutes ago. Uh, what about this? Um, so find the arc length of one arch of the cycloid. Well, again, R is like a fixed thing, correct? R is like our uh, radius. Theta is our parameter here, okay? So you think of R as just being a fixed thing. So what's like, I, I would write dx d theta this time. So what is dx d theta? R just comes along for the ride, but what's dx d theta? One minus cosine of theta, and what's dy d theta? Uh, so, well, this one's interesting because you just have a one sitting there. So R is like a constant, does that make sense? Even though it looks like a variable, it really is a constant. So what's the derivative of the R times one part? That's zero, okay? So the derivative of this thing, what's the derivative of minus cosine? Sine, so this would be R sine of theta. Okay, so what would the arc length be? 
the arc length would be equal to the integral from zero to two pi, the square root of dx d theta squared plus dy d theta squared. So it would be r squared one minus cosine of theta quantity squared plus r squared sine squared theta. Now here's the thing that's kind of interesting. You can actually, uh, you can actually do this integral. And there's some nice trig, uh, trig identity stuff that you can take advantage of, but it's actually possible to do this, this integral once you kind of uh, multiply out the one minus cosine theta, it all, it all kind of works out amazingly, okay? So for instance, let me just, uh, so look, here's the formula right here. Any questions on, any questions on what this formula is all about here? Okay. So let me just, uh, let me just actually go and, and do a little computation. Okay. So by the way, here, uh, let me get rid of this stuff. Watch this. So here is, here is the cycloid of radius one half, okay? You see this? Here's the cycloid of radius one half. Okay, but I said I wanted the arc length of one arc of the cycloid, yes? One arc of the cycloid. So let's actually go over into Wolfram Alpha. Okay. And let's do, a, you know, I'll do integral of what? Of square root, what was what is it that I had? So first of all, what was the radius I was doing over there? I was using one half as the radius, right? Wasn't it the square root of zero point five squared times one minus cosine? I'll just do cosine of x squared plus zero point five squared. I always get nervous with this. I probably need to put a times right here. Okay. 0 0.5 squared, what was it? It was times sine squared, sine of x squared, squared. So the square root of that from zero to two pi. Okay, so let's see if it understands what in the world I just said. Okay, does that look right? Yeah? And what does it say? What does it say the uh, the length of that arc is? Two. That's interesting. Okay. Let's see if we could try to predict what's going on here. If I, what if I wanted a different radius? I wonder if they would just let me put R in here. I don't know if they will or not. Let's see. Will it let me do it? Is it actually computing it or no? I don't think it's computing it. Oh, it did it. Eight times the square root of r squared. What is that really? Eight times the square root of r squared is what? That's just eight r. That's amazing. You're like, what? One arc of the cycloid seriously gives me eight times the radius? Okay, so there's eight radiuses of that wheel that was rolling. That's going to be the length of one arc of that cycloid. Okay, does that work in the case where R was one half? Think about it. Or was our radius one half in that case? Well, shouldn't the answer have been four? What's going on here? Hang on. So if the radius was 0 0.5, okay, 0 0.5, oops. And it's a one half from zero to two pi. It gives me two. It doesn't seem right. Something is, is sort of messed up in this thing. Um, but uh, the answer is something like this. Okay. What if I put what if I put a radius of two? I wonder what I would get. I wonder if I put a radius of two in here, what I would get. Sixteen, huh? Maybe it is eight R. That's weird. I got sixteen, but but when I put in one half, eight times one half, 
That's not two. That's not two. That's four, correct? So I'm not sure what, what the deal is with that, but uh, there is a way to actually do this integral straight up, but we'll talk about that next time, okay?